Well, a month after Lincoln's assassination, there takes place in Washington a gigantic two-day event called the, Gr the Grand Review of the Union Armies. A giant parade of the, of the, the first day, the, army of the, the Eastern Army, Grant's victorious army, they're all parading through, you know, with, you can imagine, with flags and bystanders. And then the second day, Sherman's great army, marching in triumph in Washington. A tremendous spectacle of the power of the new national state that has been created by the Civil War. This could never have happened in the past, this, this gigantic display of military power. The poet Bret Hart was there and wrote a poem about the Grand Review in which he sort of mused about those who could not march, the, the casualties, the people who had died in the war. He imagines um, a, um, well, what he calls a phantom army of the dead. Um, I saw a phantom army come with never a sound of fife or drum, but keeping time to a throbbing hum of wailing and lamentation. The martyred heroes of Malvern Hill, of Gettysburg and Chancellorsville, the men whose wasted figures fill the patriot graves of the nation. And there came the nameless dead, the men who perished in fever swamp and fen, the slowly starved of the prison pen. And marching beside the others came the dusky martyrs of Pillow's fight, the blacks who had been killed at Fort Pillow. Now, this very haunting poem is like a rebuke to the romantic patriotism of celebration at the end of the war. It, it, it implies, in a way, that the war was not worth it, that the sacrifice uh, was too great for what might have been achieved. In some ways, Hart's poem is rem reminiscent of, to me, of the Vietnam Memorial, the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., because both of them say the meaning of the war is in the dead soldiers, right? That's what they memorialize there. This is what he's talking about. But there's another little suggestion buried in this poem, the reference to Fort Pillow. In other words, blacks had achieved equality in death. Would the country be able to give them equality in life? He, I think um, Hart is putting that question on the agenda. That would be the, that is, will be the fundamental question of Reconstruction. And perhaps the answer to that question will determine whether the war was worth the price or not. In other words, Hart, so you can't answer that question in 1865. Now, in the Janap book, we have this document by uh, Robert Keane uh, about an official in the War Department in Richmond about the causes of Confederate defeat. And you've read this or should read it this week. And he lists like eight different causes. He does not emphasize the greater resources of the North. He talks about fiscal policy. He does say we didn't have enough manpower and there were too many desertions not enough food, incompetency of military men. That's kind of odd, because there's so much literature saying how superior the Southern generals were. Lack of horses, faction, Governor Brown, Stevens, etc. Lack of a representative man, a leader, in other words, Davis. And, of course, slavery and inherent weakness when deeply invaded from desertion to the enemy and joining their army as recruits. Now, if you look at those eight causes of Confederate defeat, how many of them could have been remedied by better policies, better leadership? Most of them. Lack of manpower couldn't, maybe. But most of them, better fiscal policy, better political leadership. The one that nothing can be done about is number seven, slavery, right? Slavery and inherent weakness. So I go back to what I said at the beginning. Slavery created the Confederacy and slavery doomed the Confederacy. But the irony of the Civil War, I think, is that both sides lost something they set out to preserve. 
The South seceded to protect slavery, and the war destroys slavery. That's pretty easy to see. Um, but the war is also the death knell of Lincoln's America. Remember last week, the transformation of the North politically, economically, intellectually as a result of the war, the emergence of a consolidated nation state and the framework for an industrial leviathan which will come to the fore in the late night. This is not the free labor world of Lincoln, of what we call Lincoln's America. You can never go back to the decentralized, small producer world before the war. So this may surprise you, but I'm going to end this section on the Civil War by referring not to one of the great historians we've mentioned, but to a novelist, a novelist I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of, J.R.R. Tolkien, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, but the book, not the movie. <laughs> not the movie is not. The movie ends differently. Did you, if you read through to the end The Fellowship of the Ring, you will see that Frodo, I guess he's not equivalent exactly to Lincoln, but uh, Frodo <laughs> at the end goes back to the Shire. But it's been transformed. It's not the Shire he left, right? It, there's been an industrial revolution in the Shire. That's not in the movie. The movie wants a happy ending. This is not a happy ending. Um, a consolidation of power, different from what he started out from. In other words, Tolkien's point is, The struggle to destroy the evil destroys the good along with it because the effort to mobilize, to win the war, has transformed the world they set out to preserve, whether it's the Shire or the Union, maybe. The Fellowship of the Ring cannot stay there. They sail away, right? They sail away because the world is so different that they're coming back to that they cannot just adjust to it. Now, a few thousand disgruntled Confederates sailed away. They went to Brazil, where slavery was still legal and uh, would be until 1888. And their descendants still live there. There are some towns in southern Brazil which are half Brazilian and half American, really. Um, and they brought this, some of their slaves with them down to Brazil. Other southerns, southerners chose a different path. Governor John Milton of Florida saying death is preferable to reunion, fatally shot himself. The governor of Florida committed suicide on April 1st, 1865. Death is preferable to reunion. In June, Edmund Ruffin, a radical secessionist from Virginia, wrote, who kept a, we like him because he kept a very detailed diary, he wrote his last diary entry, quote, I here repeat and would willingly proclaim my in unmitigated hatred to Yankee rule, to all political, social, and business connections with Yankees, and to the perfidious, malignant, and vile Yankee race. And then Ruffin, too, took a gun and killed himself. But unlike them and unlike Frodo and Gandalf, Most Americans at the end of the Civil War could not sail away and could not or would not commit suicide. They had to live here. And as Wendell Phillips put it, all of us, he said, have to live in the world the war made. The war created a new world in America. So for the rest of the course, we're going to see what the consequences of the war were and what that new world, or the struggle to determine what that new world coming out of the war would be. So we'll see you next week.